All right. Well, thank you guys for uh, for doing this. It's really exciting to be here. This is my first EMA. I feel like a newbie compared to lots of you here. Um, no, I was so excited uh, when Mark, when you first approached me about this, the idea of Fortnite and gaming and putting climate change into games. Um, clearly not something that had occurred to me before and probably not something that occurred to, to many of you here. So hopefully we all can all learn something together. Um, just by way of a little background, as I said, I'm the climate columnist at the LA Times. And I, you know, mostly I've written about energy policy and really wonky stuff in the past. And I've, I've spent a lot of time the last, um, really boring, I could talk to you about FERC and interconnections for the next 20 minutes, but I won't. Um, and I've spent a lot of time the last six months getting really into sort of the nexus of climate and entertainment. And the reason for that is just as a, as a journalist, obviously I'm doing the work that I do because I think it matters and I think you can, you know, slowly over time move the needle, but it just gets so frustrating because, you know, when you're dealing with facts and stories and, you know, telling people what's happening politically and with policy, it just, it can be so hard to reach people and it can be so hard to get people to, to listen when so many people don't want to listen when they just have these reactions of, oh, well, that's, you know, that's Democrat or that's Republican or that's, um, you know, that's just something that I don't want to engage with. Whereas you people in this room, as I think you know, which is why you're here, you have this incredible ability through the stories that you tell to sort of incept people <laughs> and to sort of, um, you know, uh, get into people's heads in a way that I think that, um, sadly, even, even journalists and documentary filmmakers and folks who are trying to deal with um, uh, reality and facts that we just increasingly don't have the ability to do. So I think the idea of gaming, um, not just film, not just television, not just other entertainment media, gaming, especially reaching children um, through climate messaging is, is really, really exciting. So uh, Mark, I, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about this idea of a climate-themed Fortnite island. Um, and I asked this question knowing that over the last week I've learned more about Fortnite than I ever thought I would know in my life. <laughs> Um, I'll admit that I've never played it before, although my 15-year-old cousin did test out your game for me, which was lovely of him. Um, I'm hoping you could tell me how the idea came about and also how it would work logistically, how it's going to work, because I understand it launches today. So talk about the genesis of this idea a little bit. Thanks, Sammy, for the intro. So yeah, I'm Mark. We, I run a nonprofit called Earthshot, and we're trying to inspire climate action through presenting more positive clean tech vision in the future and putting clean tech into spaces where young people are. And if you ask where they are, they're on games and social media and read graphic novels. So that's what we're doing. Um, and, and that's how we began to generate it. Before I talk about the Fortnite Island, any gamers in the audience? Uh, wrong crowd, I guess. A few hands went up. Cool. Um, that's good. So what we were thinking about is how do we put clean tech and climate solutions into the video game process. Not creating a environmental game. There are plenty out there, but the only people who play it are the people who care to begin with. So how do we put it into the gameplay? Just get a part of fun gameplay and that people can engage with it. How do you reach the people who aren't looking for this right. stuff, basically? Get them to play anyway, because it's gonna be fun and exciting, and then they're actually gonna see things like oil wells that you have to plug, which is our Fortnite island, I'll explain in a minute, or solar panels or wind turbines, and they're gonna ask, what is that? Why is that in my gameplay? And that's what actually happens with young people these days when they're playing these multiplayer games, they're chatting with each other, they're engaging with each other, and Steve will be able to talk about that more. So when, as we were thinking about this, was how can we use gaming in Fortnite, which is one of the largest games on the planet, allows us to build How many people are playing Fortnite? Like four million to 10 million every minute or some crazy number? Like what, what is it? It's uh, I think 2.9 to 4 million concurrent users at any given sorry, time. Sorry to interrupt, but I just, it's crazy how many people are playing yeah. this game. Anyway, continue, Mark. Um, and it, so it, it's amazing, not crazy, it's great. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. great. Yeah. And so we can build our own island and build our own gameplay and put it out there and get these millions of players to come onto the island, find it in the Epic Game Store, it's free. And you just play it, you don't have to pay to get into it, um, and we can engage people with it. And that's what we're doing. So the game is out at lunchtime around the corner from the food. We have two PlayStations set up with the island going. So come over and try your hand at it. Even if you've never played before, we've got, we can instruct you how to do it, come out and try it. and see what we're doing. And, and how does it work, right? It's about plugging oil and so gas wells. This first one, and I'll let Sean take over, is about what Trade Water does is in the real world, they plug orphan gas wells and collect up old refrigerant canisters. And so the island is a parkour course race, that's an obstacle course, 
It's a death run race. You've got to get through the race. Before the toxic zone catch you, you've got to use your bow and arrow to plug oil wells and click up canisters and get to the end before you run out of energy um, or the toxic zone gets you. And then you get high scores both on time and how many oil wells you plugged and how many canisters you picked up. And it's, it's fun and engaging and hard, according to a bunch of people, except for teenage boys who find it pretty hard, but not too hard. So, so by plugging the oil and gas wells, you prevent the methane and stuff from leaking into the atmosphere and causing more climate change. And by collecting the refrigerants, same deal. They don't, uh, they don't cause more global warming. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Sean, uh, tell us about trade water. And uh, a little bit Mark alluded to this, but what, what do you guys do? What's your business model? And how did you get involved in this game? How's it going to help you? Sure, yeah. I uh, work at trade water. Um, it's a small business B Corp. It's based in Chicago. I'm based here in California. And um, like you said in the game, we focus on two climate issues, um, leaking gas wells. There's millions in the US um, that don't have an owner that to actually is responsible for it. We also um, collect and destroy old refrigerants. Um, they're, they're both non-CO2 gases, both aligned with Project Drawdown, if you know about Project Drawdown, that lists the biggest climate issues and solutions in the world. And that's what we do. And so um, we do work all over the world. Um, I actually found out about Trey Water back when I used to work at a tech company when the book Drawdown came out. And refrigerant management was on the top of that list. And I was floored because I've been doing this my entire life. And I didn't know that was a climate issue. I knew it was an ozone issue. So I went out to my network. I'm like, who in the world is actually doing this work? Um, I found Trey Water. And then two years ago, I decided to spend 100% of my time scaling climate solutions. And so um, that's what we do at Trey Water. And we can talk about that later. But Mark and I have been friends for years talking about climate and sustainability and storytelling and the lack of really a narrative that engages people not in this room. Like, how do you build bridges to people that don't think about it every day? And I feel like storytelling is the thing that's the most lacking in the work that we do. Um, and so when I found out about what he was doing at Earthshot, we started talking and saying, and then I started thinking, how in the world would you imagine the work that Trey Water does in a Fortnite island? Because I have two, two teenager boys. And I, they did a mock-up, and I said, oh, it is actually really cool. <laughs> yeah, you, you were saying before I came in here, it sounds like they've never loved you more. <laughs> I've, I've got... I'm exaggerating I've a little bit. The, a my, little. my two boys were the first uh, testers of the island. And the quote that I love saying is, uh, my two boys said, look, we know, Dad, what you've done your whole life. You, know, you spent your whole life um, in the sustainability space. We know it's always been super important. But this is the first time you've done something that, that is, like, super cool. <laughs> And you just kind of pause as a parent and as a dad, and I said, I'll take that. So, I mean, so obviously the raising awareness of what you do is incredible, and, and this game, I, I, I hope, does it. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. H how does it benefit your business? And talk a little bit about the financial side of it, too. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing is just getting the message out about the climate issues that we address and the climate solutions that we go and do the work. So one is just getting the word out to people that don't know about it. I mean, I've been in the sustainability space my whole life, and I didn't know like refrigerants was a climate issue. So if I didn't know, that means most people don't know. And then again, with methane well. So one is just awareness for young people to find out about these are climate issues, but there's people out there doing this work. So um, maybe you sell more of these offsets as a result. Because yes, and so the way it. we finance our work, because none of the work that we do is um, mandated by governments. And so the only way we can monetize that is through the carbon markets. So we go out and do this work around the world, um, we pay for that up front, and then we're able to monetize it because we, um, we create carbon credits that are validated, and then that's how we recoup our money, and then we go out and do it again. But not, and, and it's unlike some of these other, you know, sort of like questionable carbon offsets with forests that might burn down anyway. I mean, you are going and plugging wells. I mean, these are legit. Yes, and it's very, I mean, we need all these climate solutions that I believe in the carbon markets, but um, ours are very black and white and very transparent. Um, the refrigerators we take and we destroy them. Right. The wells that we plug. So um, there's there's that, and then as I understand it, if if enough people play these games, maybe there's some actual revenue generated by yeah, it. Yeah, and that, I think that's the one is the awareness. I think the most exciting is, and again, I talked to my kids about this. Is as are people as people are playing the game and doing these fun actions in the game, the more people that play, it can generate revenue from uh, Steve's company. 
back to Earthshot and to Treywater, and then we invest, we go out and do the work in the real world. So it was a really cool conversation with my kids of, hey, if this island goes viral and people, are, you know, thousands of people are playing it, um, that's going to help my company go out and do more of this in the real world. So I love that gaming real world tie. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the, the dream of what this could be. Steve, let me bring you in here because I mean, um, and, and I want to go back to the, you know, the, the business model stuff, but just the idea that you're the education program manager at Epic Games, I, that is not a position that I would have guessed existed. Talk about what that means. What, what do you do at Epic Games that's education related? What is your job? Sure. And um, <clears throat> before I do that, I want to follow up on Mark's question before yeah. and ask how many of you have people in your lives that play games? I had a feeling. Okay, Everybody's got a kid or a niece or a nephew, right? Um, so, you know, that's my audience. Um, I, I work, um, so I'm thrilled that Epic, you know, has an investment in education. I was a classroom teacher for 28 years and started doing some work with Epic while I was still in the classroom and then was able to come on full time to support secondary education. So what my role is, is around supporting adoption of our tools in the classroom, um, supporting educators and students with resources and training, and really our tools, um, if you're not familiar with like Unreal Engine or Unreal Editor for Fortnite and some others, are industry tools that if students are learning these skills, we're preparing them for jobs in many careers, and actually many of you here um, in entertainment might be well aware of Unreal Engine and how it's used in like areas like film production, virtual production, and such. They shot The Mandalorian on that, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's how I know it. Yes, there you go. So, um, so that's so my role is around, you know, really supporting education through wanting students to learn through games, but also to become creators using our tools because they are the ones playing, and they're the ones that will be kind of creating content, you know, to really further, you know, the the work that's done here. So, so give me, I mean, give me some examples. Like, what are you educating kids, and how old are these kids? Um, talk about it a little more. Yeah. So, my my focus is secondary education is primarily high school, but I say you know middle school through community college is kind of my my area. Um, we also do have a part of the team that focuses on post secondary and then industry. So, I'm really focusing on the the people in their first kind of entry to using these tools. So, really. Um, simple onboarding. So some of our resources might teach kids to create their first game in Unreal Engine, and we do that with step-by-step -step guides and things. So that's been used anywhere from kids in, you know, fifth and sixth grade through high school. Um, we, you know, we have learning kits around things like creating a Rube Goldberg machine in Unreal Engine and, and things like that. So, um, you know, really, and, and then a lot of extracurricular, like summer camps and things. So really that high school, middle school through community and college. And you have lesson plans that are based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, right, that you're providing yeah. to teachers in classrooms. Yeah, Talk that's about been... Why, why do you have that, or how do they work? That, that's a great question. So um, I'm, you know, passionate about social impact and, and, you know, supporting, you know, those things. And what I was really pleased about is when I started at Epic, I found a lot of other people internally that were also interested. So it was easy to get support around that. And the neat thing about the UN Sustainable Development Goal lesson plans is what we have students doing is going into tools like Lego Fortnite or Fortnite Creative and prototyping solutions to real world problems. So I know a lot of people today have been speaking about like rising water levels. So one of our um, SDG lesson plans has students go through a design thinking activity and then in Fortnite Creative, which is a creative mode in Fortnite, they build out a solution to that issue. So they're really thinking through the problems and coming up with real solutions to these problems, which is really great to see as a way that they're both learning to use the tools, but also applying what they're learning. Maybe this is a question with an obvious answer, I'm not sure, but how, how does Epic Games benefit from that? Like, why is it good for you guys to be teaching kids to like protect Miami through Fortnite? Yeah, you know, <laughs> well, I, I mean, for one, there is the social impact yeah. piece. No, I mean, obviously that's but great, but what is it? What the, is it I, I think when we bring in things like, like social impact and climate and all, we're reaching an area of the curriculum that is very meaningful in school. So teachers are more likely to be able to bring something like that into the classroom. If kids are learning these tools and then getting the skills and then entering industry, you know, they're becoming users of our products for sure. It's more fun to learn about some of the environmental stuff if you can actually build something yes. in a game with it. I mean, that's 100%. Kind of mm. Do you, I mean, and 
I have another question for you, Mark, but one, one more, Steve. If, if Mark and Sean here can build out this model and show that you know, there's a real audience for a climate-themed Fortnite uh, island, uh, I mean, do you see Epic Games potentially going in that direction? Could you guys build one yourselves? Because the most popular ones are the ones that you guys build, right? Well, great question, because we are very invested in user-generated content. Okay. So we want people having the tools like Mark's team and like Wes's team who created it to be the ones creating the content so we could, but I think it's also very right. compelling when other people are creating content and then we can support it. I and maybe stick it on the homepage as I recommended. That yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> Trying to help you guys out here. Yeah. Yes. Um, but being recorded, right? Yeah, I, I hope so. I forgot to turn my recorder on at the beginning. Um, if anyone has one, um, Mark, you said that if I, I mean ultimately your goal here, as I understand it, is is if this works out and you guys are able to generate some revenue or raise some money, you want to build more of these, right? I mean, this is just the beginning. Talk about the talk about the the cow manure monster idea. Yeah, so That's we want to build thing. a series of these things to to basically get people engaged in yeah. in different technologies. So one of the sort of big issues out there is plant based meats and cultivated meats and. And one of the types of gameplay that the, the, because the the beef industry and carbon emissions and meat, right? Yes, yeah. and I think this audience knows that beef is big climate polluter. I'm sure um, someone will come up and yell at us afterwards about yeah, it. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Continue. Um, but one of the gameplays is called a tower defense, and basically you're there and you've got to defend something against some evil creature. Sometimes it's zombies and other things. In our case, it's going to be giant cow throwing poop monsters, throwing methane bombs and poop bombs at you trying to take over your tower. And if you think about what's going to attract teenagers, particularly teenage boys, to play an island, it's going to be throwing poop around and <laughs> you know, trying to defend against it. So you know, that's just one of the other things. We want to get more serious, too, with wind turbines and other things as well. But you know, the idea is really to engage and to generate sort of engagement and then have them come and understand what it is. I, I can tell you for sure my 10-year-old nephew, who's not quite Fortnite aged yet, or maybe he's just getting there, but he will absolutely love the, the cow monster, manure monsters. Um, and I, I think a, another revenue model or another revenue stream you want to work out, you want to license some of the stuff that you build in Unreal Engine to other buyers. Can you explain that too? Well, not license. So what we or want to do is we want to actually give away. So in Unreal Engine, when you have to build things, like if we're doing solar panels, you actually have to find an asset. Some of them are already built, but some of them we actually have to build a 3D asset. And then what we want is people to be able to use that either in their own islands or in commercials or things that people are using Unreal Engine. So as we create 3D assets for our islands, we're going to have them free to use for other people. So as we build wind turbines and solar panels, because there aren't any right now in the Unreal Engine, so we're going to build them, make them cool, and then other people can use them. So if other people start using them, it gets more traction. Yeah. How, how will you be evaluating whether this is, you know, a success, I guess? And I want to ask you a version of this question, Chushan. I mean, is it, it, you know, is it just simply do you raise money to build more islands? Or how are you thinking about does this, you know, does this succeed or scale or not? Number one is how many people play and how long and how viral it can go, Yeah. you know, on this one. And how many people then go to the website to look to see what they did. And then it's raising money for the next set of islands as we're a nonprofit. What, what about you, Sean? Is it a question of how many oil and gas wells are you able to seal as a result of this, or how do you think about it? Um, I think it's it's two things. One is bringing awareness to just, I mean, not just our climate solutions, but others. And I love how Mark's thinking about that, because one is, I mean, the gameplay has to be super fun. Um, for, like, our solutions, it's the work we do is very blue-collar, right? It's it's not a, you know, a shiny object that's that's some crazy, you know, climate tech solution. And so making the gameplay fun is super important. And then, but again, bringing that awareness to that it's not all doom and gloom. There are solutions out there. And again, if the island goes viral, it does generate revenue for us to go and do more of our work. Um, but I think the bigger picture is really, really getting the word out to young people that you know we can do this. Um, and there's not one solution out there. We have there's lots of solutions that we need to support. But again, having you know teenage kids of hey, we can do this together. I mean, I think that's the what I'm thinking of as a professional, but also as a parent. Let me put one last big picture question to all of you, because I'm seeing 30 seconds on the clock, and we'll push that just a little bit, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, we're in a room here with some of the most influential storytellers in, I, I was going to say America, but the world. Um, 
what would be the lesson that, that you all would want to impart on what types of stories we should be telling, you know, with regards to climate sustainability? How, how should the people in this room be thinking about this issue and what are the lessons that we should be imparting and what are the stories we should be telling? And I'll, I'll open that up in whatever order you want to take it. So what we're all about is really trying to combat the climate anxiety and depression that's happening that's getting people to pull away. You know, for a while, people were kind of moving forward to it, but I think in the last decade, young people have just been pulling away thinking it's hopeless. And how are you going to generate people to then change that and come back to inspiration and doing something? And that's by storytelling, showing people the tech that's out there, showing people the solutions that are out there that they can actually get behind and do. So that's what we're trying to, to, to engage and through the places where people are. So we really creating this positive vision of the future. Show people that there is a future. Show people how to get to that future. And that's what we're trying to, to get at through these types of things. Yeah, and I, I think um, an important thing, of course, is to tell stories that invoke you know, a call to action. And I think we have such a great opportunity here. And you know, the people here are the greatest storytellers. Um, and we can do that through games, but we can also do it many other ways. But I think if we can, you know, like, get kids to take action based on what they're learning. I mean, that's the, I think, where we want to be. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm guessing some of the folks in this room and the companies you work at um, probably have a bigger social media, media following than Tradewaters. <laughs> um, so just kind of sharing this out. You know, you come and play it in the next few, next few days, putting on the, you know, your, your company's social media making it go, go viral. I mean, that would be so exciting. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'd love to, and just to have a conversation with all these people in these rooms. These conferences go so fast. I see a bunch of faces in the crowd that it's hard to see because of the light. I'd love to meet, you know, we'd love to meet all of you and find out what you're doing. Um, I will say that Sean's comments remind me that I think I'm contractually obligated to do a small bit of self-promotion. I write a uh, twice-weekly newsletter for the LA Times called Boiling Point. If you go to latimes.com slash boiling point, you can sign up. Um, thank you to these great panelists and all of you for being here for this conversation. Thank you so much.